everyone, Pastor Jeff Woodward here from Metro Church. How wonderful to have you with us again for what we call My Story, which is an incredibly interesting window into someone's life. Almost always it's someone who's a part of Metro Church, but occasionally we like to bring you the story of somebody who I guess is still a part of the Metro family. Uh, but there's somebody who is visiting with us. And so today, in a minute, I'm gonna introduce our great guest to you. But you know, before we do that, I always wanna pray over your giving, over my giving. Uh, to me, it's a sacred moment. It's a sacred thing to do and to be a part of. Some of you at the end of this will wanna be able to give your tithe, your offering. Others of you might wanna be able to give a love offering. Uh, to uh, my guest and to the ministry that God has put in front of them. And at the end, I'll tell you a bit more about how you can do that. But right now, I just want to pray over our normal giving, that which many of us do every single week of our life. And, you know, I just want you to know what a difference your giving, your serving, your praying makes. I believe that none of us are the whole answer, but every one of us is a part of the answer. So let me just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness, for your graciousness. Thank you for all the wonderful things you are doing in our life. Lord, it would be easy for us all to look at the problem or the challenge or the things in the big worldwide stage that seem so difficult and so possibly impacting to even our life. And yet, Lord, we would miss the small things that you do every single day. Thank you for every blessing, every joy, every guidance, every help, every moment of peace, every strength. Father, we bring our giving to you too and want to love you with that, want to worship you through it. So, Lord, I pray your blessing upon every home, upon every life, upon every giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you for that. Now, uh, I don't really think my guest needs any introduction to those of you that have been a part of Metro for a few years because you'll definitely know this wonderful man of God. Others of you, perhaps you've just stumbled on us on our Metro Church WA YouTube site and you're listening to this, being a part of this wherever you are around the world. And this person's going to be new to you, but I hope you'll love them just like we do. And that's none other than Dr. Robbie Sondrega. Thanks for having me, Pastor Jeff. It's, uh, it's, I don't know if I should be nervous because, you know, when I thought, oh, we're going to sit down on the couch, it's going to be a psychological <laughs> consultation with you, no problem. But, hey, the roles are reversed and should I be nervous? Uh, not unless there's anything that uh, you don't want us to know. But other than that, no, you just really relax. I think that's probably one of the great benefits for me, Robbie, over my whole life is I thank God for the friends that I've got to do life with. You know what I mean? I, I thank God. I really do often will stop and go, thank you Lord for all these people that are a part of my life. You feel the same? Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It'd be pretty horrible, wouldn't it, to do any kind of life, but particularly leadership life without having friends. Well, you can only go so far. We are, we're not just better together, but you know, none of us are as smart as all of us. Yeah, true. And so, uh, yeah. But there's something, isn't there, about, and we're way ahead of where I was going to start already, but I just want to linger on that for a minute because I've got friends of mine that are leaders or whatever that, when I say they're my friends, I know them, but they don't seem to have many close relationships in their life. Um, and I think, well, that's a bit sad, really. And I really hope that everyone that's a part of this uh, are making the effort because you've got to really step out of your comfort zone if you want to make friends. Scripture says, he that or she that would have friends has got to show themselves friendly. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's a common thing, especially among male leaders, is it? that we have um, great isolation in our lives, especially if the, the higher up the ladder you go, the more lonely it becomes. Wow. And if you're at the top of your game or your profession in any arena, well, who do you, who do you talk to? Yeah, so right. all too often you're 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 leading, you know, in a, in a different you know sphere under you, and and it's. It doesn't have to be many, mm -hmm. as long as there's a few core people. We usually use the the law of four, right. um, four corners of a picture frame with you in the middle, right. um, and and that 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 concept of four is four people on the stretcher bearer, four four pole yeah, bearers, wow. if you They're will, people people who are willing, like the cripple guy, yep. willing to do whatever it takes to get you where you need to go. Yeah, well. How cool is that? Yeah. Well, anyway, we feel like you're our friend. So thank you for coming, being here at Metro again. Uh, if you missed Dr. Robbie, this is last Sunday um, before we're recording this. 
Uh, so that was Sunday the 19th in the morning. I've had people saying to me today, what a great message. Oh, that oh, was good. so powerful. So Very good. thank you so much for that. My Going pleasure. from healed to healer. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. That's Very it. good. Well done. Anyway, listen. We want to get to know you a little bit better, Dr. Robbie Sondarega. Okay. I'm not, your, I'm not used to this. Cause what's your middle name? <laughs> I don't have one. Oh, really? Because Sondarega is long enough. That's, okay, well. <laughs> that's what my parents always said. So is Robbie, R-O-B-I, is that a derivative of Robert or something? No, that's my full name, and it's a Swiss name. Oh. And, uh, yeah, but I'm, I have a lifetime of, of hearing and learning other sayings and spellings. <laughs> wow. So, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know the feeling. So you mentioned about your Swiss name, but you've got a Swiss heritage. Correct. Your great grandfather was the, have I got this right, the president of Switzerland. Correct. During World War Two. Yes. Yeah. So wow. president of the the, the parliament, uh, the wow. Bundes president, and um, and Switzerland only ever has a general when there's a time of war. So his best oh, friend, wow. General Gizon, together they oh, fortified wow. Switzerland against Nazi Germany and uh, and maintained their neutrality. Wow. And uh, were able to welcome in those who were seeking refuge. I just finished reading a book actually about someone from the Holocaust, and they were part of the great caravan who first of all headed to Switzerland for their neutrality, and then it became a jumping off point for them to other parts of the world. So thank you to the Swiss, by the way. Uh, you just gave us more than, you know, knives, pocket knives. <laughs> and chocolate. <laughs> and, and chocolate, and, yeah. and, and yodeling. I mean, that, that was a big <laughs> contribution to the world that we that we gave. <laughs> you know, it's it's an important, you know. <laughs> Stop <laughs> right there. That's a first for my story. We've never had a, had a yodeler before. Are you a professional yodeler? <laughs> No, it's because of the cheese that we eat. You know, yeah. it's uh, <laughs> there is a problem with the cheese. It's got holes in it, but the Swiss engineers are working on that. Don't worry. <laughs> I remember driving through Switzerland uh, a few years ago, and if you've never been there, really, it has got to be one of the most beautiful countries on the planet. Yes, it is. You caught a train down from Davos to have dinner with Rhonda and I. Yeah. Uh, and we felt so honoured that you did that. But then we were applying you with all kinds of questions about Switzerland. I remember driving on one of the highways to where we're going, and it seemed to go through about 720 degree as it elevated up, yes. through a mountain. Yes. Inside a mountain. It was yeah. like... Corkscrew. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most bizarre things. You Swiss can invent stuff, huh? Yeah. I think the inspiration for all of the tunnels came from the cheese. Oh, and really? <laughs> and so the, the landscape is like Swiss cheese. There's holes everywhere. Wow. Yeah, tunnels here, wow. there, and everywhere. So were you born in Switzerland? No. I was born in the United Kingdom okay. and um, and grew up in Australia. So, wow. you know, I have multiple passports. My other name is Jason Bourne. Just don't let anyone know. Um, but yeah, so so I, I feel like a fish out of water. I don't feel like I belong any specific place. Uh, others have been known to say, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm oh, not yeah, quite right. there yet, okay, but yeah, I would yeah. love to bring, you know, that kingdom to earth and wherever I am, whichever nation. And um, yeah, I feel like a, a global citizen, not, not domiciled. Siblings? I uh, had one sister uh, okay. passed away in her okay. mid-30s, and wow. um, and so now it's just me and all my brothers and sisters around the world like yeah, yourself. Wow. So growing up, at what age were you when you left the UK? So I left at the age of two, and oh, wow. um, my family travelled around the world for a little while, a little bit like gypsies, wow. and um, in a in a Volkswagen bus, travelled throughout the United States and Canada, wow. um, kind of just searching really where where should they settle, and uh, we ended up settling in Canberra of all places, the nation's capital of Australia. My heart goes out to you already, <laughs> <laughs> but. The good thing is it's a great place to grow up. So oh, wow. clean, new, safe, and close, most importantly, close to the ski fields. Which leads me to a little bird told me that you were a very active and competitive snowboarder. Yes, back in a past life. <laughs> so how do you get into snowboarding in a country that really doesn't have a lot? Of, you, your mum or your dad were willing to drive you to the... 
Ski fields? Is that... Well, the ski fields are just two hours away okay. um, from from where we lived. And my father was a, a Swiss pastry chef. Right. And so he would work during the nights. And if he's driving home early in the morning, just as the sun is coming up, and if he would see a, a fresh dusting of snow on the Brindabella Ranges, he would wake my sister and I up and he would say, we are going skiing today because skiing is much more important than school. He had his priorities <laughs> down pat. And so I grew up skiing and snowboarding wow. was... Well, came in. I was an early adopter of the brand new sport in 1984 is when I first started wow. snowboarding at the ripe old age of 11. So, yeah, wow. so, yeah, it was a it was a great, great little. So how far did you go with snowboarding? Um, yeah, quite far. So so I was a professional snowboarder for a while racing yeah. on the Australasian circuit um, and teaching professionally in Europe, in Switzerland. Um, in a little ski resort known as Klosters or Klosters, as the English like to refer to it. Now, my wife reminded me the other day, you must have told us, or we found out somehow or other, didn't you teach, was it Prince Charles, or as he was back then? Yes, back then, now King Charles yeah. and, and young Harry and uh, the royal entourage um, back in the day. It seems like a past life ago yeah, well, now, yeah. yeah. But yeah, those were fun days, good adventures. It's kind of the Klosters is the place where all of the, you know, the who's who of the zoo, whether it be royalty or, you know, uh, dignitaries um, tend to go. And it's right next to Davos, which is where they held the World Economic Forum, where all the world's leaders come every year. And uh, so it's an interesting place to be. You get to see and rub shoulders with some very, very interesting characters. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Any, anything you want to tell us, you know, down on the down low there about the royal family, you know? I, I think that it's interesting in my line of work, having worked now with, you know, whether it be heads of state or, or people who are successful in business or, or royalty, people are people. Yeah, and and that's, the, that's the walk away. So whether you're at fine dining restaurant, People are telling jokes just like they would be around the campfire um, at the other end of the spectrum in some other demographic. And and people all have challenges and problems. And at the end of the day, we are human. Um, how, no matter how much we might prop um, people up and put them on a pedestal, at the end of the day, you cut them, they bleed red also. I was reading the other day about uh, something that now is called prestige bias. You know, the fact that we have an inner motivation to look for people to look up to. Um, and yet my experience is not quite, a, I haven't met, you know, the royal family, I don't think. Though maybe once when I was at outside Buckingham Palace, I'm not sure. Uh, but we tend to look at people like that as they somehow or other their lives are great. And social media nowadays almost gives the impression of, wow, your life is amazing. And I look at my life and I go, I <laughs> know. Oh, and yet, like you were saying, the truth is that every one of us, no matter who you are, how rich you are, uh, every one of us has got issues and difficulties. Jesus did say in this world, you will have tribulations. So I think yeah. he's probably pretty accurate. Yeah, I'd go so far as to say the, the only qualification that you need in order to experience some kind of travesty or hardship in your life is simply to be born, that no yeah, one well. no one is immune to the challenges of life. And uh, It's a little yeah. depressing sometimes, though, to realize, isn't it? And, Yes and no, because if you look back on your life and if you were to ask yourself the question, which are the points in my life that I experienced the greatest amount of growth all too often, it's immediately after the lowest or most challenging yeah, well. point in your life. And so if we do well to learn from our great challenges, well, we discover that whatever we go through, we can grow through. You and made that so, point on Sunday. I remember at one point in the service, you talked about growing through uh, the issues that come your way, which I know for me often have been at the moment when I'm in them, I'm just like the psalmist David going, God, where are you? Why aren't you doing something? Yes. Aren't you looking? Can't you see what's going on? And then later on, you know, look back and go, I, I thank God for that trial because it did something in me. Yeah. And I know now for me as, as an older believer, I look back at some things and just laugh and go, well, hey, this is nothing. I've been through that. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's not true for everyone, though. No, it should not. be said. Like, you know, that it, it that age old catchphrase, you know, that Nietzsche quote, that which doesn't kill you only makes you stronger is only true for a select small group of people. Mm -hmm. For the rest of us, that which didn't kill us almost killed us. <laughs> and now we walk around with a limp you for can... the rest of our lives. Yeah, well, that's and true too. So, so a great-grandfather who's the president of Switzerland, your dad's a pastry chef, 
you're a professional snowboarder. Where on earth does psychology come from? Like, what was the deal for that? I think ski and snowboard instructing and psychology are great parallels. Okay. <laughs> Not parallel skiing, just yeah. just a parallel because it's a little bit like the hairdresser. Um, you're spending time instructing and you're taking people who are out of their comfort zone, doing something they've never done before, which requires incredible patience and tenacity to be able to repeat that lesson over and over until you develop a degree of competence. You'll be sitting on the chairlift going up and in those down times when people <laughs> are winding down, they start to open up about their life. And so as a ski and snowboard instructor, I was like the quasi psychologist already just listening to people's problems as they're unwinding or offloading. I just didn't know how to offer any suggestions of help or hope um, back in those early days. And so thank God it's just a different profession now, except there's no snow around. So psychology though, for uh, amongst some Christians, has got a bit of a mumbo jumbo style of, yeah, you know, attachment to yes. it. Yes. You know, a bit of like, well, we don't need that because we've got the Holy Spirit. Yes. And I'd go, well, he made your brain and he made your, he gave you a soul. So that means he's going to find some ways to relate to that in there. Um, for you as a believer and then going to uni and doing psychology, was there any tension, you know, in your studies for that? Really, no. When you look at it holistically and you understand not just what to know or what to think, but really how to think, and that's the study of psychology. Why do we think the way in which we do, but also how do I critically appraise the research? And so if you look at you know scientific studies and understand the nature of operational science, there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, you might get some wishy-washy pop psychology that might counter you know an ideology of, of from a theological background, but there is no single scientific discovery that I have ever read um, that comes from an operational scientific standpoint that in any way ever contradicts scripture. Mm -hmm. And so Bible and biology, science and scripture, they actually go hand in hand because all of the major landmark discoveries that have been made, especially in my field of science, in, in clinical psychology and neuroscience over the last 10, 20 years, have all only ever served to confirm and validate what scripture has been saying for thousands wow. of years. It's funny because I was reading a couple of books recently. One was at the end of it, it went through all of the elements on the periodic table. I know this sounds a bit weird, but I was enjoying reading it. And then it got to this one, I think it was called Dysprosium, and said, it's the only, this is the, the book was written in 2024. Okay. It's the only useless element on the entire periodic table. We have yet to discover uh, a use for the element. Then lo and behold, I'm reading a book a couple of weeks later that talked about how dysprosium has now become one of the most sought after metallic elements because now we're using it in brand new batteries and, and you know, computer stuff or whatever. And I thought, you know, we, we pronounce something as being useless and then God goes, no, I've got a plan. So yeah. I, I got yeah. this. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like they it's like they said just before flying was, you know, <laughs> invented or, or demonstrated that it could be done. There's no there's nothing new to be discovered in physics now. Exactly. All that needs to be done is just to refine those yeah, right. discoveries that have already been made. There's no chance that we can fly. We've already disproven that, you know. That that's a pipe dream that yeah, well, you know, except for ballooning. That 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 might be the uh, the only exception. God, and then the Wright anymore. brothers came along. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So when I first met you, I remember one of the things I was told about you was that you were had been going to Uganda. Uh, a lot of us have heard of, you know, the Lord's Resistance Army, I mm -hmm. think, and child soldiers and a whole lot of unbelievable evil going on. How did you, like, how does a Swiss Australian skiboarder turned psychologist go, I think I'd like to go to Uganda <laughs> and work with some of the most traumatized people on the planet. How did that happen? I would love to say that there was this lightning bolt <laughs> that came out of the sky that, um, but look, I, my PhD was in the area of transcultural mental health. So I was working oh. with a lot of refugees from war-torn areas and uh, and and migrant families and, and looking at what makes somebody resilient versus what makes somebody more vulnerable to developing trauma or post-traumatic stress. 
And and then we started asking, you know, well, why why do we have to wait till they come here? What if we we were able to go there and do early intervention and prevention um, before you know problems manifest? And uh, and so one day, I am don't tell my friends. I'm watching Oprah Winfrey, and she's interviewing this lady who comes on, who's had her daughter abducted, one of the thirty to fifty thousand children who were abducted to be used as child soldiers and sex slaves, and she just refused to remain silent. And so she started a little organization. She was a midwife, and she started an organization called the Concerned Parents Association to help support uh, all of the other parents who had also. Also had their children abducted, and needless to say, they were just a little bit concerned by that. And in this interview, um, she happened to mention that you know they have a lot of children now who are either rescued or who are captured by the UPDF, the the the, the army in Uganda, or they escape. And so they bring them into these these childhood rehabilitation centres and do trauma therapy. And I'm like, well, hang on, that's my area of expertise or specialization. Maybe there's a way in which I can serve. And so I got in contact with them and flew over and, and sat down with them and, and asked the obvious question, so what kind of trauma rehabilitation do you do? And they they confessed look, that we don't, we don't really know anything about trauma. And so we just put loud music on and allow the kids just to dance. And I thought, oh, okay, I, I can gel with that, like some kind of dance therapy or, or something like that. And then um, they described the ceremonies that are being, you know, um, encouraged by um, UNICEF and, and UNHCR that, that to incorporate ancient cultural traditional practices from ancestral worship days. And so they bring the witch doctor in to do a cleansing ceremony because, you know, when they were abducted in the bush, they had all sorts of other ceremonies performed on them. And I'm like, oh, okay, so like just what, kicking out some demons and replacing them with others? I, okay, <laughs> right. And so, and so when I started to ask about, well, what about about evidence based research driven outcome oriented you know therapeutic initiatives because we know a lot about trauma now and so i started sharing some ideas and they're like we've we've never heard anything like this before and i thought wow there's 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 a great opportunity to serve and that's how it all began wow wow so how many years ago was that you started on? So my first trip, I think, was around the 2003 mark, oh. 2004. Oh. I started going um, almost bi-monthly after a while as we were training up all the various different humanitarian organizations on the ground. And at that time, they were mostly in the townships of Gulu, of Padea, of Lira, and they they weren't in the refugee camps. Um, and they everyone from you know World Vision to Samaritan's Purse to to um, the Raquel Rehabilitation Center, the great organizations doing amazing things. And so we're just coming alongside them, encouraging them and providing evidence-based research-driven um, trauma therapy that is appropriate at a pediatric level. And then when everyone was done, we thought, well, our job is done. Our job is also done. Then we can, you know, go back to Queensland, sip a latte at Malula Bar on the beach and live our perfect life. And that's when everyone said, no, 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 the real work hasn't even begun. We've wow. got 1.7 million refugees scattered along um, 120 different refugee camps on the southern Sudanese border. And at that time in 2004 or 2005, there was only one organization, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, who had stationed two, that wasn't 2002, so two midwives in one of the 120 camps to service a population of 65,000 people. And uh, and so when you naturally ask, well, why isn't anyone helping in here? And they're, well, it's because it's too dangerous. Yeah, well. um, you drive on these roads, you get ambushed. And, uh, and so... That, that that was the obvious Has that ever deterrent. To you? <laughs> Never been ambushed, um, but had a few close calls. So oh. car behind us ambushed one night. A couple of people got killed, and oh. but I just I just in working in war zones for the last twenty years, I have always felt safe. I can't explain it. I just feel like there is a supernatural protection around me wherever I am. Whatever's happening, I can be literally looking out the window and seeing rockets bombarding, you know, a, a particular city, um, which I can't mention. But and I just, I, I feel surreal. It's like I'm watching a movie. There, there's always a supernatural protection. There's around. a level of, uh, in, I think, in the general public of that some traumas are too big and you can't recover from them. 
you know, we've all seen somebody on a news thing where something tragic has happened, say, oh, I'm, I'll never get over this, or it's said about them. Yep. They'll never recover. And yet you're dealing with people that have, as children, had levels of abuse that are just beyond imagination almost. Are you saying that those people go on to live happy lives, productive lives, you know, that they don't, you know, cry themselves to sleep every night kind of stuff? Or, you know, is, is you know what I mean? Because I think for the average person listening to you, we kind of go, oh, I know if that was me, I'd, you know, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd be finished. We can look at the extremities of torture and trauma around the world and and be horrified by what we see. And yet it's amazing how resilient people at the same yeah. time can be. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will make a recovery, um, but but in my line of work, people will often say, oh, it must be so hard, you know, you're always in war zones and natural disaster areas or working with survivors of human trafficking. I mean, that's such a, you're dealing with the the, the, the real heart, hardest, most devastating and, and traumatic, it must be depressing. And and I and I'm quick to say, actually, no, it's it's not a sob story, it's a success story. There's yeah, well. there's there's great news at the end uh, of a journey of a person going through rehabilitation. Um, but it should be noted that even though we, in the comfort of our lives, look at that and we think that must be horrendous, well, it's equally as relevant on the front line as it is on the home front, mm. because even though an enemy might come and attack you. I would go so far as to argue that betrayal trauma from a loved one is even greater because it messes not just with your physical body of what might have happened in the assault, but it messes with your mind that you had trusted this individual and now you are devastated. Your life has been shattered into a million pieces. And it's not to say that you can't make a recovery from such devastating trauma. It's just that it well, it might take time. Well, let me ask you on that. I'm glad you mentioned that word there because I was about to ask you because the old you know, saying goes like, well, you know, these things just take time. But I've watched people for whom time didn't help at all. Yes. Uh, time simply meant that the wrong processes that were in their thinking or in the conversations around about them simply embedded that thing even further. Um, so it's got to be more than just time. And yet, Time is incredibly important. I often say to people, you, if, if they come to me for help, I go, you've got to become your own best friend. And I go, I say to them, if your friend was going through this, you would speak to them like this. Mm. You would be encouraging. You would point them to a better future because you just would. But on the other hand, what you're saying to yourself is the complete opposite. So how about you decide to become your best friend? Um, you know, And that seems to help, so... There is, if you if you think about psychological trauma in the same way we would physical trauma, there's a process that is required, and time does play an important role, but it's not the only role. And so, if somebody gets into a severe car accident, and they're in traction, and they've got you know head injury and and broken multiple bodies and gashes and uh, not bodies bones, <laughs> and, and and we would never come along and say, well, just like get over it, like just come yeah. on, like you know, just forgive the people who you know who crashed into you and just move on with. We would we would never say that to a person with a physical trauma. So the question is, why would we ever say that to somebody with a psychological trauma mm. unless, of course, the bones have healed, <laughs> um, the, the the bruises are gone, the, the cuts have mm. healed over, there's scars now, yes, and, and the head trauma, you've been rehabilitated in that process. Uh, there is a pathway that we can go on. It's just that it doesn't happen straight away. How do you not lose sight, though, of the hope or the goal or the progress in the mists of pain that come along with yeah, and I'm not thinking about someone, uh, you know, in Uganda or um, in one of the other war-torn areas. I'm talking about people that I know in Australia for whom, you know, they've gone through some terrible grief or some tragedy. Um, and, you know, the, the emotions are present and they're now. And the hope of a better life is ahead and not now. How do you not lose sight of what's coming up? 
Many do. And that's where we lose hope. But when we understand that hope is not just something that I have or don't have, but rather it's something that I can learn to cultivate, then it's not just about keeping my eyes on, on the prize. It's, it's making a decision to believe that my tomorrow is going to be better than my today or my yesterday, even though I cannot yet see it. And so... So how do you do that? How do you, you know... Had in a very practical way. So someone who's a part of this uh, My Story session and goes, I've had the loss of a loved one or a business went belly up or whatever, or they got a bad diagnosis or, you know, family's gone awry. What can they do on an everyday basis for that? Make a transition and understand the difference between having no hope and feeling hopeless. So when somebody says, I've just got just no... Just say that again, because that's very good. So when somebody says, I've, I've just got no hope, mm. ask them, what, what do you mean by that? And they will likely clarify and say, well, you know, I just kind of feel hopeless. But having no hope is not the same of having as having less hope. It just means that you have less of it. So long as we have breath in our lungs, we still have hope. Wow. Because to have no hope means you're dead. And wow. so we all, just like faith, we all have a measure of faith. Well, we all have a measure of hope. And hope is something that we can grow by understanding what it actually is. It's not wishful thinking. It's not focusing exclusively on an outcome. Um, so it's, it's making that mental transition of rather than just focusing on the result of what I want, when I want it, and this is what I'm placing my hope in. Um, well, no, you can't place your hope in anything outside of yourself. Mm. Uh, we work in various different places um, where there are refugees that, you know, they say, oh, if I could just get, if I could just, you know, get out of this situation, out of this refugee camp, then I'd be happy. Or if I could just get me and my family to Europe, then mm. we'd be happy. Mm. And, and then now you're in Europe and you've got no job. And well, if I could just get a job, then I'd be happy. But hang on, I'm starting at the lowest and it's not, mm. and it's actually expensive in Europe. And if I could just get a pay right and it's always kicking the can down yeah, the road right. and, and you never get it because it's outside of yourself. Mm. Whereas if, un if you understand that hope is, hope is a resolve Mm -hmm. not just a result that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So I might not have the outcome in terms of what my heart desires. I might not get what I want when I want it. But if I posture myself to believe, now God is good and his promises are what I'm going to stand on. And he says that all things, not some things, not most things, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So therefore, Good is coming my way. It just might not be in my way mm -hmm. at my time. It's mm -hmm. coming my way, but just not in my way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to have the resolve that God is good. And while I might not understand it, I'm going to stay fixed in heart, but remain flexible in mind. Wow. And that's my resolve. Good things are coming. And that's my hope. My tomorrow is going to be better fixed than my heart, today. Flexible in mind. Very good. Excellent. Wow. Um, I'd like to ask you, briefly what you can tell us because you've been working in the Ukraine which is very top of mind to all of us here uh, I think our papers almost every day will carry something about the conflict in the Ukraine and we have been praying for our churches we've got five churches in Kiev and praying for those people there and hearing some of their stories um, but you've been working at a vastly uh, more significant level in a sense of the people that you work with. Can you tell us much about that? I can't share too much other than to say, we, look, we work in various different trouble hotspots and conflict zones around the world. And I'm amazed uh, by the people in Ukraine at their level of resilience. Wow. So that when an air raid siren goes off and there's either a drone, a plane, a bomb, a rocket, uh, uh, something's headed our way. Well, everyone shuts up shop takes shelter and when the siren is over well we open the shop back up and life goes on wow. so it's coming up to summer now the streets are open the flowers are blooming there's coffee smelling good on the streets and it's like life is normal except every now and again um, usually a couple of times a day the the air raid sirens will go off and everyone so there's what we describe as resilience yeah, and, right. and the word resilience is it shouldn't be misunderstood it's not emotional strength and we are tough and we can get no it doesn't matter how strong you think think you are, what matters is how flexible you are. 
So I often think of resilience being like a tree that gets blown by the wind. And as the saying goes, that which does not bend will break. And it's funny so, though you mentioned that because I was only reading, I think yesterday, uh, there was a, a big experiment done, I think it was California, where they built a biosphere. And the whole idea was that they were going to see humans putting them in this amazing environment where everything was self-contained. So all the food, blah, 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 blah. And they put people in there and it went on for a couple of years. And then they began to discover that though they had the climate right, they had everything right, the trees started falling Falling down. over, yeah. You've heard this one? No wind. Yeah, there was no <laughs> wind. And they realized after a while that trees needed something blowing against them if they were ever going to become strong. I don't know what they did with it, but I just thought that was so cool, you know? That's so true. So we do need the wind. We do need the resistance in order to grow. And the same is true with anything. If you go to the gym, you're engaging in resistance training in order to grow your muscles. That's the whole purpose. I could talk to you for about another couple of hours. I'm I'm sure time's going. But while we're on that spot there, as a parent, because you've got five children. Yes. So we've all heard of helicopter parenting, the whole idea of, you know, we've got to stop our children ever encountering any pain, you know, and now we've got trigger warnings for everything. And and, and I'm not making light of the difficulties that some people can experience with that. But if we're not careful, we can go so far that we will raise children uh, that for whom anxiety is their new normal. Yes. Yes. Just quickly, now as a dad, (laughs) how have you gone about going, I'm taking all this stuff because... A lot of us there, we are more conscious of all that's gone wrong in the world and the world's become a scary place for yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. And yet, you want to grow kids that don't fall over in the biosphere. That they're resilient. Yeah. And so as we were saying, the whole definition of resilience is is when the wind blows, you, how able are you to bend with the wind? And when the storm is over, how well able are you to return to your original positioning? So when it comes to children... Raising healthy, resilient children is not to protect them from bad stuff. It's not the absence of bad stuff that makes for great kids. It's the input of good stuff. So when the bad stuff happens, what do we do next? You can't always control what happens to you, but you can develop the skills to learn how to control what happens in you when those bad things happen. And how able are you to face those fears as they come along? Because if we don't face our fears, if we're not exposed to them, we become like the trees in the bios where there's no wind and therefore there's no resilience. And in fact, that's one of the greatest protectors of people against trauma is past trauma. Wow. Past trauma is one of the greatest protecting factors um, that we can have. And so we don't we don't shy away or run away or try to minimize. No, we go, this is where I'm at. This happened. This is real. Now, I'm not going to speed it along. And, you know, we don't want to encourage anybody to go, well, why are you still suffering? Like, get over it already. What's your problem? Like, just snap up. No, it takes time. But on the right journey, on the right pathway, yeah. you can end up being stronger than what you were before the tragedy took place. Hey, man, sounds great. Listen. We've got to bring this to a conclusion, and in a minute, I w- would love it if you would pray for people, because I know that there'll be people who are part of this service, and they're there going, well, that sounds great, and for a minute, their hopes rise enough, uh, but then the next day, that same person says something that they shouldn't have said, or the pain gets, the, you know, the scab gets ripped off again. Um, but before we do that, have you got a favorite Bible character? Yes, Eve. So Eve, what? she's the mother of the first what? human, you know, child. Yeah, I've never heard anyone say that one. And there's no reference point. So, you know, in the in the in the animal kingdom, you know, <laughs> Adam must have said, I mean, Eve, lay off the beer, because like you're starting to like, like what's going they had no idea. They'd never no one had ever had a child before. And then <laughs> and then in the animal kingdom, you know, the, the giraffe is born or the cow is born and, and so it stands immediately to its feet and starts going moo. Yeah, uh, right, right. And so, all right, well, we'll just copy what the animal kingdom does and so you know the baby's born and we'll stand it onto its feet and it falls over hang on we'll stand it back on its feet and it falls over hang on i think we got a broken one <laughs> or at least say something and it just makes this sound ah, ah. every other animal talks immediately what's what's wrong with they would have had no idea and yet god entrusted them oh, with the so future funny. of humanity she's a hero <laughs> well, i never would have imagined that's that's true. That's great. I shall have a different view of Eve from now on. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. All right. Would you pray then for people that uh, in their own life right now 
have a great need of getting the starting point for resilience, going, you know what, I'm in this right now, I didn't ask for it, may not be their fault, they may have done nothing to contribute to it, but they're in it, and you're going to go, okay, how are we going to get out of it? It'd be my pleasure. Thanks. Well, God, I just thank you that we get to come alongside you and um, that we are walking through valleys that are deep and dark and it seems as though it has a smell of the shadow of the valley of death in it. But we don't need to be afraid because you're with us and you never leave us nor forsake us and there's nothing that can separate your love from us. And so if that's true, then God, no matter what we might be going through, whether it be some kind of external trauma or tragedy um, that was no fault of our own, like a car accident or a medical diagnosis or, you know, God forbid, even in a war zone setting or a natural disaster or even more personal on the home front, um, turning up the dial on severity where there's betrayal trauma. God, these things are devastating to our lives. And sometimes we even gasp for air, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to get on with our lives. God, thank you that even in these moments you are with us and we can stand on the promise that all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so we just want to say thanks. Thanks that you are for us and not against us. And if you are for us, then who or what could be against us? So help us keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to be resilient because the time is coming where we are able to bounce back. And God, if we follow your processes and stand on your word, then that which doesn't kill us will truly make us stronger. So thank you that we can be catapulted out of our crisis into our calling to glorify by you and your name in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Robbie. That My was pleasure. wonderful. Hey, if you are somebody who's a part of this and you hear all these stories and hear Dr. Robbie and myself talking about God as though it's somebody that we know and walk with, well, you're exactly right. I know there was a time in my life when that wouldn't have been a concept I would have grabbed or would have even understood how to, to take advantage of. Uh, and I still remember as a young man being in a place where for the first time I encountered what a lot of us would call the the very real presence of God, that God was there. I don't mean a religious emotion or something like that. There was an undeniable sense of, wow. Uh, and in that moment, the reason for living seemed to me to line up. I wouldn't say I understood it all, but it just seemed like, at that moment, it was like, oh, yeah, this is it. And realizing that there was on an offer for me a relationship with God. I can honestly say after all these years, if you were to ask me what's the, the best thing, what's the most important thing, I would say to you, it's walking with God every day. It's the fact that like you've quoted, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll make everything work out for good. And you go, well, how can that be? Well, it wouldn't work if it's up to you, but it will work if it's up to almighty God. And he sent his son, Jesus, so that every single one of us can have a different life, a new life. Uh, Jesus equated it to being born again. And so I would love to pray with you and for you. If you are at that point in your life where you say, Jesus, I'd like to know you. I want to say yes to you. It's so easy. Up on the screen in front of you right now is what we call yes text. That means you simply text the word yes, Y-E-S, just those three letters, uh, to that number on your screen, 0488 If you'd rather get our encouragement via email or you're outside of Australia, then you can go to yes.metrochurch.org.au. Either way, the day after we hear from you, get your yes, we will send you a Bible verse and we will send you a prayer. Now, they fit on one screen of a smartphone, so it's not a lot of reading or anything. But we want to help you hear from God and learn how to talk to God, have a conversation with Him and develop a relationship with Him. And that's different every day for 30 days, different scripture, different prayer. And then there's a whole lot of other things you can opt in for there. Here's what I promise you, though, as well. We'll never spam you. We don't ever write and ask you for anything. That's not what this is about. This is about us saying we know what it's like to start a journey with Jesus. We want to help you do yours. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for these amazing people, wherever they are. And they might feel in their bedroom or their study or their lounge room or on a beach somewhere or other that nobody else in the world understands them or knows them, but you do. And you are there with them right now. And you've arranged for them to hear this and to be able to, in this moment, 
say, Jesus, I'm saying yes to you. So I thank you for them. I believe, Lord, that this will be the start of a great brand new life for them. It'll seem almost as though old things have passed away and everything's become new. So thank you for them. We pray that you will guide them, be with them in every moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So send us your yes, would you? People do it all the time and we love hearing about that. Um, I'm sure one day I'll get to meet you and whether that's this side of heaven or not, but we'll look forward to that. By the way, you're always welcome here at Metro Church. I say that often to people because I think sometimes they think, well, you know, do you have to belong in somewhere? You got to sign something? No, no, just come. We'd love to see you every Sunday. Um, on the, I know Sunday the 16th because this is going to air in the beginning of June. Sunday the 16th of June, I believe, after the morning service, we have what we call Metro Life Long Table Lunch. And we've got a basketball court downstairs and there's a table right down the entire middle laden with food and we'd love you to be our guest. Come along to that. It's a great opportunity to be able to meet other people and uh, I guess to enjoy one another's company as well as being able to eat some pretty cool food. So we've got 80 nationalities in this church so that should tell you there's a lot of different foods there and they're wonderful for you all. Hey, thank you for being a part of that. Thank you again, Dr. Robbie Sondrega. Pleasure. And look forward to hearing some more about all that God is doing in your life, through your life, because you're not just to be healed, it's to become a healer. God bless you. See you again. Mm -hmm.